Okay. Hello and welcome everyone to the Jenkins Google Summer of Code year 2020. This is the coding phase one demo part two. We had part one earlier today, which you can find on our YouTube channel once we publish it. Yes, this year uh, being a challenging year, we have uh, come together and we participate in the great movement called open source. The Jenkins community is mentoring students under the Google Summer of Code program. Right, so we're now, we're now in the, um, part two of the student presentations. So I'll give a brief introduction to Jenkins in Google Summer of Code, or as we call it, as we shorten it, JSOC. Then we'll have our uh, project demos by students, followed by questions and answers. Which JSOC organization are we? We are the one on the left, pointed to by the arrow. We are um, operating the Jenkins and the Jenkins X Summer of Code projects under this banner. And Jenkins is part of, the greater or of a greater organization called the Continuous Delivery Foundation. And that organization runs other Summer of Code projects. Please visit their websites for more. The Jenkins community is in its fourth year of participating in the Summer of Code program. This year we have 20 project ideas and we've been able to accept proposals from seven students. As a reminder, our capacity to accept student projects depends greatly on how many mentors we can recruit. And this year we are very fortunate to have with us an average of two to four mentors per project. As mentioned before, we have projects for both uh, the Jenkins open source um, project and the Jenkins X open source project. Jenkins X is, uh, is not the same as Jenkins, but the difference is uh, for a late, uh, uh, the, the explanation between the two is for a later time. To learn more about our, uh, how we operate the program, please visit our main page under jenkins.io slash projects slash GSOC. You can reach us um, through our different channels. So we have a mailing list um, under a Google group. We have a Gitter chat under gitter.im slash jenkinsci slash jsoc dash sig. And the dash sig stands for special interest group. We hold regular office hours on Wednesdays, on Wednesdays online or as a video chat as needed. We have project specific channels which you can find by visiting our uh, Jenkins, um, Jenkins website. We have links on each project page to those specific channels. And the Jenkins X operates the communication using Slack. Okay, Q&A during uh, this presentation, you can use the Zoom chat. You can also um, ask your questions on Gitter. And after the presentations, if you have further questions or want clarifications, please don't hesitate to reach out to us on Gitter or on our mailing list. We also have a code of conduct um, that we're uh, updating um, pretty soon. Essentially, we, are, we just want to be nice to one another and that's what we our codifying and our code of conduct. If you want to see these slides after this presentation, here's a short URL at the bottom of, um, at the bottom here where you can find these slides. So uh, before we get started, I would like to thank our formidable students for the work that they're doing on their respective projects. I wanna thank our dedicated mentors who are assisting students uh, with their projects. And I want to thank our org admins who are uh, making things possible behind the scenes. Earlier today, we had part one demos. So um, now we're uh, going to have part two demos. The part one demos were the following. And the part two demos are the uh, machine learning plugins for data science. It will be followed by a presentation for the Jenkins Windows Services YAML configuration support. And lastly, our last demo today is going to be external fingerprint storage. 
So before we start, would anyone like to add something to the introduction? Hi, this is Marky. I would just like to uh, congratulate all of the students, uh, all of the mentors and the org admins for yet another great Google Summer of Code year. And I'm very excited to see uh, what these crop of students have done. It is very exciting indeed. Anyone else? Plus one. Sorry, I didn't get that. Uh, just plus one. Um, plus yeah, one. we have already delivered a lot of stuff. Uh, many projects have previews uh, for Jenkins users. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to all these features to be delivered. And I'm proud to see all the uh, JSOC projects on the public Jenkins roadmap of this year, which is a kind of new thing being compared to previous years. Great. I'm excited to see that. Thank you, Marky and Oleg, for your comments. All right. So I want to make a, a quick comment just to thank uh, Martin and Oleg for coordinating this, this whole program. I know it's a huge amount of work and just sitting on the sidelines here and getting the emails and all the organizational stuff that you guys are doing. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. We invested in a lot in uh, automatic, uh, automating and documenting uh, JSOC and Jenkins. So maybe in a couple of years, we will be able to replace uh, ourselves with Jenkins instance and a few pipelines for sending emails. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so now I would like to invite Logi to present um, coding phase one of the project machine learning plugins for data science. I will stop the share so that you can start your share. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen right now. Okay. Yep. Share. Is that visible to everyone? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome to my presentation on machine learning plugin for the data science. So uh, a quick introduction to myself. Uh, I was selected for GSOC 2020 with Jenkins. Uh, I'm doing my major in computer science and engineering uh, from Sri Lanka. So next we move on to the presentation of coding phase one. So here we are, we are addressing a problem with a common data science discipline in ma machine learning field. So uh, this can be uh, related to a real world story. Uh, when I was working in my previous internship, uh, I had a chance to work with Jupyter Notebook with a Postgres SQL for a NLP machine learning project. So in that project, uh, the Jupyter Notebook creates a Postgres SQL to database to store all process data and every single data processing will be reflected in the database. So I need to, so every time I had to check the data is up to date manually while I try to build the model using my Python code in the Jupyter Notebook. So this is even worse when this happens in the production line when we are creating a machine learning model for in the industry. So these inconvenience could be resolved uh, efficiently using CDCI. So here what we are saying is alone interactive notebooks are not capable for building a production level machine learning model. But, but, they, are very, well, they, but they are very excellent in both uh, data analyzing and coding at the same time. You know that uh, we can visualize, visualize interactively from the Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is, uh, is giving a great uh, support for the machine learning in this software world. So we cannot simply ignore notebook uh, to build our models. So our goal is uh, to automate these challenges in machine learning, in machine learning workflows from end to end. So in this slide here, it is a simple uh, way of using CDCI principle uh, applied to machine learning problem. Uh, this can give a sort of insight why we are here with this our plugin. So first of all, if we take a production line, uh, first data engineers are the responsible persons for the data processing. Then the data scientists will uh, 
build a high accuracy models using processing processing the data and the code so they have to uh, run iteratively to build a high accuracy model so using this model ml engineers and software engineers uh, will do the rest of deployment works as usual in the software development industry so this is a simple way of explaining how cdca can be applicable in machine learning production environment so why we are using the jenkins to automate these changes these challenges so uh, one of the reason is there are lots of plugins have been developed and maintained that can be very useful for automating machine learning workflow in the production uh, for, for example if, if you want to push uh, one of one ml model to a s3 aws s3 storage uh, there's a s3 publisher for that so likewise there's a lot of plugins can be integrated with the jenkins so we don't need to do a, a scratch work from uh, bottom to up to uh, to satisfy these uh, these workflows so in the next slide yeah in this slide uh, after i have selected for gsoc uh, during the community bonding period uh, we have spent a little time to name our plugin and design a high level architecture that that gave good insight to mentors to guide me uh, later we created a repository and uh, we prepared for the coding phase ones and a lot of interaction happens uh, in the co community bonding so so far we are done with these features in the phase one coding the first one is uh, configuring uh, configuring the connection between ipython kernel and jenkins instance uh, in the next uh, user will be able to copy their notebooks to the workspace in jenkins uh, if they want to uh, convert the jupyter notebook into python files and the json files uh, json files which can be used to run uh, the notebook by cell by cell uh, that will that will be very useful when we are running the code we can understand what's happening in the code and we can easily get the, get the knowledge of code so the next feature is uh, we can build uh, jupyter notebooks uh, python or json so these are the features we have done with our uh, coding phase one yep so next one is demo before going demo i will give a short description about uh, what what i am going to do in the demo so first i'm going to configuring uh, the, the local ipython server in my local machine and then i'm adding uh, jupyter notebooks uh, then i am going to build a model with the diabetics data sets with the logistic reg regression is a it's a simple linear model you can use it very simply uh, there are maybe 20 lines of code we can build a model so for the demo purpose i have created that then uh, we can use another notebook prediction score we can use it to predict uh, how the model predict the model accuracy so the accuracy means uh, how many patients are classifying who are data diabetes or not so we will move to the demo so first i'm gonna configure my server so here uh, in server let me let me interrupt you logi we still see the slide of the demo with the different bullets maybe you want to change what you're sharing yeah thank you okay okay yeah is that okay right now? Now we can see it, Lohi. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Yep, so I have already uh, configured. Uh, uh, I can't see. Okay. Here, yeah. okay, I, I can configure a new server here. So you can add a name, like uh, it, it could be, it should be alphanumeric and it can contains only uh, underscore like I can set a local server. So next one is you have to add the IP address. You cannot give any more form the IP address. So the validation will say, it will say that it's a more form. So we will do a 
simple local host or maybe you can add as a local host to this server so the launching timeout is about uh, the how long it will be take to launch the ipython kernel in the server and the next one is the results is uh, uh, how many lines you can get you can gen you can get from the results so sometimes if you if you if you know about pandas in the machine learning uh, it will if you print uh, the you can print your whole data sets you can see so if you add three you can only see the three three rows of data so maybe i can add something so in this next i will test this connection so it's creating okay the connection is successful because it is in my machine so it's very speed so i'm gonna save my configurations So yeah, we're done with the global configurations. So now we are going to create a job, a freestyle job. Freestyle job. Okay. Yep. Here we go. So in this case, you can, you know, uh, these are the descriptions panel and you can select uh, any service you configured in this global configurations. So it will show every service you can get in the global configurations. So for this demo, I would like to add a, a database data sets to this machine learning machine learning demo. So I'm gonna use a file parameter. So I'm gonna use the name as diabetes diabetes dot csv csv is a famous format for the data set. So in the next build environment, I would like to add my notebooks in my local system so i'm gonna give my absolute path for this for these files demo I'm, i have my uh notebooks in my log uh, in my in my computer model dot ipi mp yeah so i'm gonna add my next uh, uh file Test model. So, if one user want to convert these uh, files, these notebooks to a JSON or a Python, so they can easily easily use this uh, checkbox. If you, if you, if they check this, it will show a simple uh, menu to convert these files to a JSON or Python. So, in this demo, we can do both of one, but we will choose JSON. So he can also name it to as a, a different different name like train.json. So in the next step, he has to use this this file path to run this 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 uh, notebook. So we will let this file as it is. And in case if you get error in Python codes, uh, you have to view it in a rich formatted view. So you can use an ANSI color plugin that can be very useful uh, when you are seeing the console in a very rich, very rich formatted text. So I'm gonna use one of these. So next is the build step is one of the important in this project. So we are created a builder. So we can, we can give the name here to train.json for one of this. And we have two options like text parser. You can directly add your code here in this uh, in text area, so it will also uh, uh, run the code from this from the IPython kernel. So for this demo, we will add a train.json, and we will add another name for that uh, test model test model dot mp. Yeah. Here we set up with this uh, config job configurations. So we're gonna save this. So when we are running with this job, we already have added a parameter. So we have to add the data set to the workspace. So here I'm adding the uh, data diabetes CSV. So it will it will reflect in the workspace in the later. So we're gonna build. Uh, 
So here you can see here it, 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 it run the course by cell by cell. So here it saved the model here and the, the second notebook will get the model and uh, give the results and the accuracy of this uh, accuracy of this model. Yeah, that's uh, that's all about the demo. Yep. So we'll move to the presentation back. So I will share the screen. Uh, okay. Okay. Yep. So that's all for the demo. And uh, yep. Uh, so the, there are exist. There are some exciting features uh, will be implemented in in the future. We are currently exploring to connect to an existing Python kernel from Jenkins, and uh, uh, we will add code editor for the for edit for editing notebooks and Python files in the code phase coding coding phase two. And uh, you can find more information about our design our design in the design document and the machine learning project in Jenkins.io. So yeah, so these are some helpful resources. You can find my GitHub repo that will have some very detailed readme. You can follow that in that GitHub repo. So these are the some uh, resources. Yeah, yeah, yep. That's all my presentation. And finally, thank you to everyone for joining in my presentation. And thank you for this opportunity to work with with this project with my mentors and org admins. Thank you for special thanks for Marky, Ines, Shivai, and Bruno, and also other org admins like Oleg. You, you gave, gave great support. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Logi. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would I'm like so, to. Uh, yeah. I would like to uh, invite the mentors to ask questions or comments. Uh, I would like to give a comment first and foremost to Lohi. Lohi, you make this extremely easy. Uh, you are an extremely talented and bright individual. I am so happy that you are a student for this project. And I, I know I've said this before, but this particular project has so, so much wide reaching uh, implications, not only for machine learning and data science, but, but in the medical field and the imaging field, there's so many things that can be used now uh, because of what you're doing. And I, I hope you understand the, the, the awesomeness of that. Uh, I would also like to thank the other mentors, our lead mentor, Bruno, who can't be with us today uh, because of the time difference. It, it's super early in the morning for him. But uh, uh, Bruno, especially Ionis, Cheve, thank you for all uh, that you do on this project. That was all for me. Thank you, Marky and, and Loggy. Uh, thank you as well. Uh, the, that was, was a very good presentation and, and uh, I can certainly reiterate uh, many of the things that uh, Marky said about the uh, development of this, of this project. Um, I'm particularly excited about this uh, because as Marky said, it has applications to uh, life sciences. And I don't know if, how many of you remember, but a few years back, I managed to uh, um, get a uh, name uh, just for that, um, for Jenkins. We have now an open source project called Jenkins for Life Science Continuous Integration. And um, I'm certainly hoping that uh, this plugin will be a big component of that as well. So great. Thank you. Thank you, Maki. Thank yeah. you, Anis, for your words. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Logi has done a very good job, uh, you know, so far. And uh, again, as you know, as uh, Maki has already said that the prospect of this uh, plugin is, you know, really useful for a lot of the different machine learning workflows that, you know, people are having. Because the more we are, you know, moving towards uh, a more digital age, you know, we are seeing, uh, you know, like uh, data science being involved in multiple sectors and having this kind of automated workflow will definitely help, you know, uh, to actually move more and more, uh, you know, machine learning models and kind of studies to a production environment. So, I mean, yeah, Logi has been quite brilliant, you know, in, uh, with his work 
uh, FX as well, and I mean the logic study has applied so far in within the plugin, and it has been you know free to work with the other mentors and you know be part of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Shuai, for your compliments. <laughs> So, uh, do we have uh, some time left for questions? I think we do. Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I have uh, one technical question. So, in your presentation, you have presented how to use uh, the plugin in these freestyle projects. Uh, yeah. Do you actually plan to support Jenkins pipeline in your project? Yeah, I I I was presented to in the last meeting, uh, but. Uh, if, but mentors preferred that you you can do a freestyle project that will be very uh, details to audience. Yeah. yeah. But technically, it supports pipeline now, right? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. And uh, the another question is how to try uh, your project out. So uh, how to get it installed and how to get it running? Yeah. So the project is uh, now we have published the alpha release. So if we want to, uh, if you want to download uh, or if you want to use this plugin, uh, you can uh, use the experimental update center. So that would be very easy to uh, download your plugin in your Jenkins workspace. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ali. Do we have other questions? Okay, so uh, let's um, move on to the next presentation, which is the Jenkins Windows Services YAML configuration support. And this will be presented by Budika. Budika, I will now stop my share and you can you can share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Martin. And uh, I think uh, yeah, I think you can share, uh, see my screen now. We can see your screen. Um, could you check oh. your microphone volume? See if you can increase yeah, it a little bit. It's up every time. Yeah. Let me. Hello, man. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, welcome to the, my project presentation. So, what I'm going to do uh, in my project is uh, under the uh, GSOC 2020. Uh, 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 I'm going to do uh, uh, YAML configuration support for uh, Jenkins uh, Windows Service Wrapper. So, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, during the presentation, uh, I will go through uh, uh, these topics. Uh, first, I will introduce myself, and uh, then uh, we will talk about uh, the service wrapper, and uh, also uh, current configuration cell and the YAML configuration support, and uh, then we will talk about uh, phase one updates, what I have done uh, so far, and uh, okay, and uh, there will be a demonstration and uh, Q&A session as well. Okay, uh, so I am Buddhik Chaturanga. Hi, I am from Sri Lanka and uh, I am a finally undergraduate of uh, University of Morotua and uh, Faculty of IT. And uh, yes, uh, this is my first time in Google Summer of Code. Uh, awesome experience and I have a little bit of experience in web development actually with Angular and C Sharp. So basically I wanted to move into computer science things. Uh, so that's why I uh, select this project. Uh, which have not much HTML things, you know. Okay. Uh, so, okay, when it comes to Windows Service Wrapper, you know, uh, we can run Jenkins uh, server and client in Windows uh, machine as a Windows service, which will provide uh, more robustness. So, and uh, actually those uh, that uh, 
feature is also uh, bundled into the Jenkins core as well. So currently, you know, uh, when we are uh, deploying a Windows service, we need to uh, feed a lot of configurations. So currently, the, those configurations are uh, uh, free to uh, Windows service wrapper by an uh, XML file. Uh, so you can find the uh, project uh, in the given uh, link. So, okay, uh, let's talk about the uh, kind of configurations a little bit. So, as I mentioned before, the configurations are configured uh, from uh, uh, XML file, and uh, the XML file should be in the same directory where the executable uh, placed, and uh, the uh, XML file's name should be uh, the uh, XML file's name should be same to the executable file names, and also a user can't uh, specify the XML file at the file path uh, from command from separately and uh, there's no XML schema validations and uh, there are limited uh, configuration checks as well. Uh, so uh, if you are interested to find uh, some uh, sample configurations file, definitely you can find a sample uh, configurations file which have minimum configurations and, and all the configurations uh, as two files from the uh, given link. Okay, uh, so uh, now we are looking at a uh, sample XML file. Uh, so you can see uh, it's uh, much uh, not verbose and not uh, human friendly. And uh, you know, it's, it's still difficult for newbie uh, to edit uh, those things. And uh, so uh, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to provide those uh, configurations as a YAML file. So that's a uh, what I'm going, uh, that's the uh, solution uh, we are going to uh, present in the project. Okay, so why we move into uh, YAML? So YAML is less robust and much more human readable than XML and definitely it's a lightweight than XML or JSON because they are producing extra delimiters. And also the YAML is becoming more popular among configuration management tools like uh, build tools. Let me see. So uh, that's the reason we are moving into uh, YAML as a configuration file. So now we are looking at uh, sample YAML configuration file. So obviously we can see it's uh, much readable and human friendly. Anyone can edit this and use this as well. So this is a kind of a comparison between those two files. Obviously you can see YAML, uh, YAML thing is much uh, readable. So it's uh, really easy to handle anyone. Uh, even without uh, good uh, programming experience. I mean, yeah, YAML experience is needed, but yeah, it's still uh, readable. Okay, so uh, this is my project scope that I am uh, I'm going to uh, do uh, during uh, Google Summer of Code uh, in 2020. Uh, so uh, obviously I will that the YAML configuration support to my project and uh, also YAML schema validation will be added and uh, new CLI, I will be talking about these things in uh, later slides and also SML uh, schema validation. Okay, uh, uh, this is how my timeline is uh, structured now, but I am uh, not going to talk about it uh, more. However, I'm happy I'm uh, on the time. Okay, uh, let's come to uh, phase one updates and uh, uh, there are a few updates uh, which are uh, as a new CLI and YAML support and SQL schema validation, which are not listed, but uh, definitely you can find uh, those uh, pull requests in uh, given links. And uh, this W project structure view is published, and uh, with the help of Oleg, thank you so much. Uh, so, if we talk about uh, new CLI, as I uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we can uh, we user can't specify the XML file from uh, externally uh, in command line, but uh, in 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 uh, in, uh, in uh, early phases we are going to uh, keep the XML support as well. So definitely, you uh, user need some. Uh, uh, we, we should allow user to uh, uh, separate uh, specify the uh, configuration file uh, separately. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, CLI thing was not in my uh, plan, but uh, definitely to move in uh, this project we need this. So uh, all CLI commands uh, was something like that. Uh, we can. Uh, uh, okay, or CLI command or something like that, we can uh, specify the executable name and then redirect where log should be redirect and uh, then the redirect path and we can elevate the command from cell and then we can uh, specify the command. So it's kind of only uh, commands manner. Uh, we can't uh, specify any options here. Uh, if uh, I mean, user want to uh, specify things, uh, it's not, uh, 
kind of structured way in uh, new CLI. What we are going to do is uh, uh, when uh, it's kind of uh, commands and options manner, like uh, uh, here's the executable, and the user can mention the uh, command, and then he can uh, specify the uh, uh, options for this. Like uh, he can uh, use this C or the uh, config file. Uh, option to uh, specify the configuration file and then he can use this uh, uh, command to uh, elevate uh, the command prompt and uh, he can use this uh, configuration uh, uh, sorry uh, option to uh, uh, specify the uh, redirect path uh, where log should be redirect so uh, there are these options in a uh, shorter manner and uh, 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 longer manner as well so uh okay uh so i think uh, i described these things and uh, and uh, i use a command line uh, library to uh, passing those uh, command line arguments and i chose uh, about 2.2k stars i think it's uh, a really good library and uh, so you can find my pull request uh, in the given link okay and then okay uh, when it's come to yaml configuration support as i mentioned before yaml uh, the configuration will be delivered as a yaml file and uh, uh, in this case uh, the uh, configuration will be uh, provided in more structured way uh, than xm and uh, i used the yaml.net library to deserialize yaml file into an object draft so that's a really great library and uh, in previous uh, library i had some uh, compatibility issue with uh, because it was uh, not support uh, it was not support for uh, .net 4.0 upwards but uh, later uh, um, Windows Service Repo also obsolete the support for uh, Windows, uh, sorry, .NET uh, 2.0, so it won't, uh, won't be a problem at all. And uh, yeah, when it comes to XML schema validation, there wasn't a schema of, uh, validation for XML uh, before, so I, I had a uh, XML schema validation, and so user can use that uh, schema file uh, in order to uh, uh, create their XML configuration file. Uh, and uh, XSD file uh, will be uh, uh, shipped as a embedded resource. So uh, in, uh, I mentioned there that I'm going to do, uh, uh, sorry, uh, okay. Uh, I mentioned uh, I will add uh, uh, YAML configuration support as well in phase two, hopefully. And uh, the my plan is, uh, current plan is used to uh, JSON schema to validate uh, YAML file as well. So, okay, uh, those are the things that I have to mention about my project. I think it's clear. So now I can uh, move into my demonstration. And uh, I think you can my, uh, see my screen. Uh, come on, come on. Yes, okay, we can uh, see your terminal. Okay, thank you, Martin. Okay, so here's my uh, uh, Windows Service Wrapper executable. I will use uh, this, and uh, this is the Jenkins.pa file, uh, which will run uh, Jenkins. And uh, in this presentation, I'm going to use this config underscore all underscore new.yaml file in order to provide the configurations to Windows Service Wrapper. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, let me show my configuration file as well. So, okay, uh, this is my configuration file. Uh, so you can see the IDs as Jenkins and uh, those uh, com basic configuration things are here. And uh, this is the uh, same XML file for that. And uh, okay, now I'm going to use this uh, YAML file in order to uh, create this uh, Windows size wrapper. Okay, uh, first I will copy the file part of uh, this configuration file because I mentioned that now user can uh, specify the file path. So, okay, in SW, first, uh, okay, uh, before that I will uh, introduce about my uh, new CLI uh, a little bit. Uh, so, uh, in previous uh, 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 Windows Service Wrapper command line, we can uh, do something like that and uh, the, uh, then, uh, okay. Path will be there, and we can uh, use the command. So, but uh, in uh, CLI, what we are going to do is uh, now uh, we have. Uh, so, okay. Uh, before going to uh, the, that demonstration, so I will uh, show what are the com uh, commands uh, available on this. So, easily you can use help command in order to see uh, those all the uh, commands available here, and uh, also you can use. Uh, 
this help option uh, in order to uh, check the options which are available with uh, this uh, command as well. Okay, uh, let me uh, show you. Okay, uh, install and yeah, uh, this will uh, show you all the uh, uh, options which are available with uh, this particular install command. Okay. Okay, uh, now uh, let me move into the demonstration. First, I'm going. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm uh, going to install Windows Service Wrapper uh, with that configuration file, and I can specify it in this manner. Okay, now uh, Windows uh, Service Wrapper. The service is installed. Uh, let us check whether it has installed uh, correctly. Okay, now. Uh, the ID and caption notes Windows W demo. Okay, uh, let us check. Uh, let us refresh this before. Okay, yeah, uh, it's uh, uh, should be there, and it's uh, difficult to find uh, all the time. There's no yes. particular search and service manager is still quite complicated. Uh, sir, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I can find it. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Okay, let me refresh it again and uh, let's see whether it is here. It yeah, maybe it actually uh, wasn't installed due to whatever reason. Uh, but it's shown. Uh, okay, mm. uh, let's try it again. Okay, I'll uh, use a shorter command in this time. Uh, yeah, but so it's saying that uh, already exists, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good question. Maybe try refreshing it again. Mm -hmm. So uh, the would that be under more... extended rather than standard? Uh, oh. Sorry, you have two tabs at the bottom. One says standard and one says extended services. Is it possible mm -hmm. under under the extended? Mm -hmm. And uh, the name should be Jenkins, right? Uh, because yeah, yeah, yeah. the name was Jenkins. Mm -hmm. I definitely oh, yeah, see sorry. It. Oh, oh my god, yeah, 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 yeah. It's here, and uh, yeah, I was finding in the caption, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's here, and uh, status is not running. Yeah, thank you so much, Ollie. yeah, yeah, I you know. Uh, demonstrations always work, <laughs> okay. Uh, now, uh, it says installed, and uh, you know, what I'm going to do is uh, start uh, uh, Jenkins with uh, this configuration file, okay. Uh, uh, then uh, we can use uh, some configuration file for that. Okay, it's starting. And uh, let me check with uh, it's state is changing. Yeah, uh, now it's running. Uh, okay, let's uh, uh, check in the browser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's working. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, fine. Uh, so uh, you can start it as a Windows service now. So what I'm going to do now is uh, now I'm going to stop this uh, Jenkins server, and I use the same configuration file. Okay, now this should be stopped by now. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. Uh, finally, I will install uh, this. Okay. Uh, so let me uh, show some uh, invalid commands. So invalid commands uh, will not work and uh, it will uh, show here and also invalid uh, options as well. Uh, so yeah. So if, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we can, uh, 
at the at the moment uh, uh, we are providing uh, support for xml and yaml uh, both so if you want to uh, boot uh, windows server stepper with xml file then it's totally okay we can uh, do with uh, xml file as well and if we uh, don't have an xml file and yaml file both then it will automatically uh, uh, go to find uh, the same xml file uh, with the same name of executable file in the uh, in that directory and uh, okay uh, let me check i think there was something yeah there's xml file so let me just install this and uh, uh, yeah Jenkins is already there uh, so uh, let me delete uh, Jenkins. okay and yeah now it will come to file is not separate now uh, it will start with XML file uh, the same uh, with the XML file which have the same name uh, of uh, executable. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's my demonstration up to now. And uh, so I talk that I have implemented the XML uh, schema validation with XSD. So you can uh, find uh, that pull request. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, this is the particular XML file that I have created yet. So you so can use this uh, XSD file in order to uh create the xml uh, file you can use this schema uh, to create the particular uh, xml configuration file uh yeah okay that's uh, my demonstration so let me go to my presentation back uh, okay uh, yeah uh, yeah that's all about my uh, demonstration so uh Please, uh, if there's any correction, now I'm open. You can ask anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any questions for Burika? Okay, question to the audience. Who does uh, use Windows here? Sorry? Pick well, me, pick I, me, I, pick me. <laughs> I do use Windows. This is Yanis. Um, quite extensively, um, and I never actually run Jenkins as a, a service, unfortunately, because I need access to some uh, local paths and other things, and uh, I don't think services allow that. So I, I'll usually run it as a scheduled task. But uh, yes, yeah, still service is uh, the most recommended way to do that for common setups because it provides a lot of uh, readability. It provides a built-in failover and other features, which are also supported by Windows Service Wrapper and now which are also supported by YAML configuration. So, yep. Yep. And uh, by default, Jenkins installs agents and uh, Jenkins uh, server as um, Windows services. So I believe that uh, this project provides a lot of value for such setups, um, especially when it comes to configuration management, because it's also a thing for Windows. Um, and uh, having YAML uh, support uh, unlocks a lot of things which are not uh, possible uh, with the current configuration management tools for XML. Yeah, person, I think that it's a really useful project uh, for those uh, who use Windows. Um, and uh, according to our statistics, a lot of Jenkins users uh, run on Windows. And thanks a lot for, to Budika for working on that. Uh, because uh, we have already got a lot of great features. And I'm looking forward to see them uh, released and to become available to all Windows Service Rapid users. Whether they use Jenkins or use other services. Because Windows Service Rapid has uh, millions of users and uh, Jenkins is just one of uh, the various ways it's used. Yeah, thank you, Oleg. Thank you for the description. So uh, I think uh, that's all. So uh, I want to give a huge uh, thank you for my mentors, uh, Oleg, uh, Mike, and uh, next turn. You did a great job uh, to uh, make the project success. And uh, yeah, thank you, Alex, so much. You were helping me even when you are in a traveling. So uh, uh, as I mentioned before, I was not into computer science. So uh, 
mental health in a lot of thing, uh, in a lot of things so thank you so much and thank you again means uh, it's a great opportunity to work with uh, your genius minds and awesome people so thank you so much okay all right thank you um could you please release the screen share so that we can oh, move yeah. on yeah in a while uh, mike would you like to add something You are Sorry, muted, Jim. Mike, if you are talking. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's move on. All right. Oh, one comment in the chat. So Mike says that uh, his microphone's not working and it will not unmute. So if you've got comments, please share them uh, via the communi normal communication channels for the um, for your, your for your for your project. All right. So our third presentation today is the external external fingerprint storage by Sumit. So Sumit, I will stop the share, and you can grab the screen. Thanks, Martin. Uh, let's just start the screen share. Um, can you screen my screen? Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for uh, joining us for the external fingerprint storage presentation, uh, which is one of the Jenkins uh, GSO project this year. Um, so, without much further ado, I'll start. Uh, so this is our agenda for today's presentation. I'll start with a first short personal introduction. I'm Sumit Sareen. So uh, I'm the student for this project and I'm currently pursuing a bachelor's in instrumentation and control engineering uh, from NSID Delhi. Uh, I started contributing to Jenkins in uh, December 2019. I made some small contributions to the fingerprints engine. And that's how, you know, uh, today, uh, you know, so it eventually led me to taking this project over and uh, I really love it. So, and thank, uh, just uh, thanks for everybody, all, uh, all the org admins, mentors. Uh, so for this project, uh, Oleg, uh, Mike, uh, Andre helping me out. So that's our project. Um, so I'll first start uh, talking about what are fingerprints actually, right? So file fingerprinting inside Jenkins is just a way for dependency tracking, right? So say you have artifacts, you have files uh, that you want to, you know, uh, basically track across uh, jobs. Uh, fingerprinting engine is what basically allows you to do that. So I just, uh, so like a, sm a small example, say you have a team A, which builds, you know, an artifact A.jar, and there's a team B that works on B.jar, which uses A.jar. So now, uh, you might have that someday, you know, uh, B reports that, you know, we have, we are having some problems with A.jar and, you know, uh, please fix that. So now you want to know that, you know, which version of A.jar are they actually using, right, uh, to fix that problem. So that's how the fingerprint engine comes in. It tells you that, you know, they are on this version and how, uh, that uh, how basically, uh, you know, which version you have to fix, right. So uh, I'll just show a small live example of this uh, fingerprint engine right so i have configured here uh basically using an instance and i have two jobs here right just like I explained uh job a and job b mm, i can't click here anyway uh so yeah so as you can see uh I'll, what what job a does is basically um yeah, so it creates an artifact a.txt. Uh, it archives that artifact and it's uh, it's recording those fingerprints which it gets from a.txt, right? Uh, and what B, uh, the job B does basically is that uh, it copies this uh, a.txt uh, artifact from the job A, right? And it just, uh, it's also uh, fingerprinting enabled, right? So now if I go back, uh, I can, you know, start a build for A and Right. And then, uh, so if I go to this build A, right, uh, I can see that here I have seen this, this C fingerprints, right? Uh, and I can see that this A.txt uh, fingerprint was actually the original owner is this build, right? And if I go click there, I can see that it was used, uh, uh, where was it used? In producing job A's build number four, right? Simple. Now, if I go uh, start a build for job B, right? Uh, 
But I can see is I can go and type this uh, build and see the fingerprints. I can see that this a.txt's original owner is a uh, is build four, right? So I can see that what are the usages uh, where this particular artifact was used, right? So that was a simple uh, live example of uh, the fingerprinting engine behind Jenkins, um, right? Uh, now, so yeah, I showed that fingerprint UI in Jenkins, right? So I'll just skip this over. Um, so, so then we come to the problem, right? What's the problem? So the current fingerprint storage engine, it's uh, saving these fingerprints in XML files inside the storage of, uh, inside the local disk storage of Jenkins, right? So now this is a problem because, you know, you can't configure uh, pay as you use cloud storages, you're dependent on the local disk storage, uh, you know, you can't create replica sets that might allow you uh, better reliability and availability, backup management is harder. And plus, uh, since these fingerprints are stored locally, you can't track them across Jenkins instances, right? So uh, to solve all these problems, uh, and, and just to you know uh, show you, you can see this screen also, right? Uh, the code editor. Yes, we can see the uh, the code. Yes. Awesome. So uh, just now I had showed you an example, right? So I'll just show you that in the work directory, uh, I have this is what this is the fingerprint that was actually created. It was A's build four, B's build four. So this is actually the XML find that you know runs behind the scenes. Um, and I'll just stop this instance. Uh, right. So that's the problem we face. So now what's the solution? So we uh, are working towards building a pluggable storage so that uh, basically plug in, uh, we can, uh, you know, provide an API inside Jenkins core, uh, which plugins can build upon. And then, you know, so somebody can, you know, build a MongoDB plugin, a MySQL plugin, they can just come in and, you know, these fingerprints can be stored inside these external storages. Uh, so, that is, you know, the goal of our project and uh, this, uh, the entire story of, uh, uh, you know, making uh, this pluggable architecture is a common, uh, is, is something common in Jenkins uh, as we move towards a cloud native Jenkins. Uh, and you can see these stories inside the cloud native SIG. Uh, so there are stories around externalizing log storages, externalizing artifacts and so on and so forth. Right. So then uh, with this project, what are our achievements till now in phase one? Uh, so, for, so uh, this API was released in Jenkins 2.242. Uh, you can see in the change log. So basically in 2.42, we have this API, we introduce methods and, you know, so basically the developers can build this and <laughs> it has 73, uh, uh, I, good, good build. So I, I hope I didn't break anything. That's good. Uh, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's our API inside Jenkins code. Uh, and then we are building a reference implementation around it. And basically this reference implementation is backed by Redis. Uh, so, so this is our uh, repository, the Redis fingerprint uh, storage plugin. Uh, you know, uh, go and give it, uh, you know, uh, just try it out, uh, give us a feedback, that would be awesome. I will, uh, the installation and configuring the plugin, everything is there in the readme. So that would be awesome. Um, right, so that's what we achieved and uh, so, I'll now move on to the, uh, you know, and, and this, uh, the plugin is released as 0.1 alpha one. Uh, so you can download it from the experimental update center. Right. So I'll move on to the demo now. Um, let me just uh, configure the Jenkins uh, instance. Sorry, I'll just take a moment. Okay, so it should be just a few more seconds. Uh, mm. Everything takes longer when you run uh, it with Zoom. <laughs> uh, that's true, sadly, yes. So yeah, so we have an instance. Uh, the thing about this instance and the earlier differences earlier, as I showed, uh, so now I should have a, you know, I'll show you that plugin installed. So if I go to manage plugins and see the original plugins. Uh, just a second. Next up. Uh, so, oh, sorry, installed. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. 
so yeah, so I have Redis fingerprint storage installed, open on alpha one release, right? So mm, I'll just go to manage things, right? So let's go to configure system. That's how you can configure your uh, Redis instance. Uh, so you know we have this tab, uh, the Redis fingerprint storage configuration. You can specify host, port. Uh, if there's an SSL connection uh, that's configured on the con uh, on the connection. So Redis uses uh, integer index databases. So you can you know specify a database number, this connection timeout, socket timeout that you can give, and you know if there's a credential involved, you can just uh, add a credential, right? So and plus uh, if you do the test Redis, which would fail right now, yeah, because I don't have a Redis instance uh, configured. Uh, and I'll just do that, um, right? So I'll just spin up a Redis server, and I'll also spin up a command line this server, and I'll just clear it out. So I now have a server running at port number six three seven nine. So now if I do a test Redis, success, voila. Uh, and now I'll just uh, apply this. And I'll just save. Awesome. Now I'll start a new job. I'll call it demo. Official uh, project. Okay. Mm. And I'll add a build step. So I'll just create, you know, uh, something that this uh, job will create. Uh, once it's run, uh, demo.txt file. And I'll add a post build action that is. Uh, Record fingerprints. So I'll record demo dot txt. Right. You just uh, say check echo demo demo. Yeah, right. So we are good. I'll just apply hit save. Right. So now uh, once I hit a build, and I hope it does not fail. Thank goodness. Uh, so and I go to this build, right? I can see the fingerprints. I can see that it's recording demo dot txt. And you know we have a uh, it's it's we found it in build number one. So interestingly, now if I go here, you'll see that in this work directory, I don't have any fingerprints folder uh, because these fingerprints now went to the Redis instance. And how can we verify that? Uh, so yeah, so this particular key is for this uh, particular fingerprint, and now I have that exact same fingerprint information stored inside Redis. So that's pretty much it about for the demo. Uh, I'll go back to the slides. Yeah, so that is the demo. So what's next? Um, we plan to extend the API, you know, the more methods. So we need to, you know, uh, we need to ex extend this API to implement tracing uh, across instances. That is something for uh, the next phases. So this fingerprint cleanup. So currently, uh, in the local instances of uh, the when uh, in the local XML-based uh, storage, what happens is that uh, those fingerprints, which uh, whose builds are no longer present on the system, are cleaned up on a periodic basis. But uh, so we need to, uh, you know, uh, have this functionality for our external storages also migration. So currently, you know, if a user installs this and has, you know. Uh, already present fingerprints inside the local instance, they won't get transferred at the moment. So that is something we're going to work on. Savable listener is something. Uh, it's a. It's a. It's a. Basically, it triggers something around. Uh, it basically triggers itself when some changes happen, and you know uh, that is something we might want to uh, you know do as a next step uh, to support uh, virtual files or you know so that might need a rework and uh, tracing as I explained across you know tra tracking these fingerprints across instances. Uh, and before the Q and A, I have these links at the end of my slide. So, you know, uh, that would be awesome if uh, you just, you know, give this plugin a shot, let us know if uh, any issues come up and there's a greater channel also link. So you can find me there always and uh, I'll be happy to help. Uh, so I'll just open the floor up to any Q&A. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody for, uh, you know, having me here. All right, thank you. Questions regarding this project? I know I have a question. So for it? No one has takes the floor. Okay. My question is when you store the fingerprint in the database, is there links back to the instances that consume the fingerprint? Uh, so by instances, are you referring to the, the particular Jenkins instance uh, which created that fingerprint? 
Yes, to the one that created the fingerprint, but also to the other Jenkins instances which may consume that fingerprint. Right. So we have. Uh, so what we do is basically because these fingerprints are ID'd by uh, MD5 hashes. Uh, so we have to ensure that you know an instance ID is also associated with them. So uh, to maintain all the current functionality, yes, we do uh, have an attached instance ID uh, whenever we save it in the Redis instance. But uh, the API does not enforce anything. So the API is built uh, such that uh, it's up to the plugin developers to decide how they decide to store the fingerprints. But uh, as far as our ref reference implementation of Redis goes, yes, we do store it. Okay, I was asking in the context of uh, cleaning up the fingerprints. So if they are consumed on multiple Jenkins instances, um, it's, um, if you have two Jenkins instances consuming fingerprints, then you cannot run the cleaner on, on one without consulting the other Jenkins to see if they if it has references to the fingerprints. That's the context of my question. Oh, so something to think about, I guess. No, I got your question. So uh, that's not something that will happen because uh, we uh, so basically there's a you can think of it like as a barrier. Uh, so the fingerprints are pretty much isolated on an instance level. Uh, when we talk about tracing. Uh, we, are, we have not built tracing yet. So uh, that might come in the form of a separate plugin. As far as our current implementation goes, if, if say a fingerprint in Jenkins instance one is cleaning up fingerprints, it will only clean its own fingerprints. It won't touch the fingerprints of other instances. So they are isolated in a sense. Okay, that's clear. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Any other questions or comments from the mentors for this project. Oleg, Andre, Michael. Oh, uh, yeah, I would uh, just like to thank uh, uh, Sumit for the hard work on this project uh, because yeah, uh, externalizing fingerprints is one of the items required for providing full pluggable storage in the Jenkins project. It's uh, really important for future architectures for running Jenkins uh, in the cloud, especially in the public clouds. Um, and uh, this project helps us uh, to move uh, towards uh, this capability in Jenkins. Uh, also, um, yeah, I would like to say thank Sumit uh, for uh, contributing to the Jenkins core because uh, uh, this project um, uh, includes a lot of complexity because we are operating basically in this uh, low level uh, code base of the uh, Jenkins core. So there is a lot of uh, various uh, aspects like compatibility, um, like uh, performance, and also uh, retaining APIs and make uh, these APIs uh, efficient for existing use cases without breaking binary compatibility. So Summit was able to study um, uh, this part of the code base and uh, to quickly start uh, contributing to that. Uh, moreover, we have a Jenkins enhancement proposal, um, which uh, documents uh, the specification for external fingerprint storage. And uh, I believe that uh, yeah, it's a really great progress and I'm looking forward to, to see what we will achieve uh, during the next phases. So thanks a lot uh, for your work on this project. Thank, thanks, Oleg, and uh, the same, you know, thanks to you all, all the mentors also. Uh, couldn't have done it without your help and guidance. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to comment. I mean, uh, you know, when uh, Simitha raised the point about uh, it being uh, part of the cloud uh, native, so I guess that is uh, in itself, you know, very big step that, you know, uh, it's today becoming of real importance. We actually becoming part of the cloud native. So I mean, yeah, I really loved the entire idea of the of the plugin. Thanks, Shivai. And uh, if you are interested in you know uh, cloud native stories, so you can uh, go ahead to this. Actually, oh, I did provide a link somewhere. Yes, so there are a lot of uh, pluggable storages, uh, other stories also in this cloud native side. So I would welcome you there also. So, nice to thank you. you. All right, any other question regarding this project? OK, 
Okay, let's uh, conclude the session today. Thank you for releasing the share. So here we are. And so this was our last presentation today. Um, this, uh, this was part two of the project demos. If you're looking for more resources on the Jenkins Google Summer of Code website, we have the link here. There are recordings about the JSOC meetings on our YouTube channel. And uh, you can also visit our blogs. They, the tag for the JSOC blogs are JSOC, is JSOC actually. And these slides, here's the super long link to these slides. And it's, um, it's, it's truly wonderful to see that um, people are enthusiastic about contributing to Jenkins during the Summer of Code program. We have other programs that Jenkins, the Jenkins community participates in. So please visit our website for more on that. So on this, I want to thank again all our students and our mentors for their great uh, work and for your participation in this open source project. And I wish you all the best for coding phase two. Um, all right, and the link to these slides, here's the short URL to these slides if you need to see them offline. And on this, thank you very much and have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you also, and thank you to our students. Wonderful. Thanks all, and uh, yeah, thanks uh, to Mark and Martin for hosting uh, the JSOC uh, demos. And it's much appreciated. And thanks to everyone who contributed uh, to the projects, so whether you uh, student, mentor, or just a contributor interested in these stories. So um, it's an effort which includes dozens of contributors and it's much appreciated. Awesome. I am going to stop the recording. <laughs>